All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Talk Data to Me here on LinkedIn Live, hosted by Lookout. My name is Hank Schles. I am your host today, and I'm very excited to have uh, two of my two of my colleagues here from Lookout joining me. We've got Tyler, who's a principal strategist here, and Angan, who is a senior staff engineer on our machine learning team. Guys, thank you both for joining me today. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Good to be here with you, Hank. Always, always a pleasure, guys. Um, so, so we're excited to jump into today's topic. I think it's obviously something that has been very, uh, very popular in the last few weeks, especially, um, which is generative AI. Um, obviously, in the context of cybersecurity, um, and we'll kind of dive into some of the potential implications, uh, where we think it's going, all that. But um, let's dive right into it here. So, Angan, I'll start with you, just to kind of level set with the with the audience here. Can you sort of explain? why generative AI is such a significant evolution to the AI that we've all kind of been hearing about for, for years at this point? Yeah, absolutely. To answer this question first, I would like to explain what AI means to end user till now, and then I'll talk about why generative AI is a game changer. Well, end users typically interact with traditional AI systems to solve mostly predictive analytics use cases such as estimating property prices in a certain geographic location or forecasting stock prices. Traditional AI systems have been fairly successful in solving these problems. Now, generative AI is a subfield of AI. With the recent advancements in generative AI, end users can tackle additional use cases, such as creating blog posts about a particular topic or generating images of interest Generative AI is paving the way for solving these content generation use cases, which seemed to be a daunting task a few years ago. So yes, this is definitely a great evolution, and we are living in an exciting time, Hank. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It is an exciting time. It's it's really good to understand that generative AI is really just sort of the subfield, as you said, of AI, because I mean, I think anybody who, uh, you know, especially is watching this, People have been talking about AI, machine learning, all of these things for, you know, for years. And, uh, you know, in the context of, of security of this industry that, that we're in, you know, I've heard a lot of arguments, right? People saying, well, generative AI could be a huge gain for the industry as a whole. Um, yep. And for, for folks like us who are trying to stay ahead, you know, step ahead of, of what malicious actors are doing, but it could also be, you know, a massive risk. And so Tyler, I'll, I'll shoot this one over to you because it's actually something that we've chat about in in past sessions um, but what are some of your early predictions about generative ai and really how it could affect uh this industry and, and also honestly some of the uh like potential uh targets and how it could affect affect them especially kind of sure. about those more highly regulated folks who are always on you know on edge about this yeah absolutely i mean you know just like any advancement in technology I, I think there's new opportunities and risks that will pretty much always present themselves so you know generative ai in general i think it has the ability to reduce the complexity of tasks overall um we can do things like retrieve information that could be valuable to a wide range of users and different personas within an organization but you know organizations may leverage generative ai to help automate a lot of actions during actual cybersecurity incidents. And I also think it, it uh, with this category of technology with generative AI, um, I do believe the first to market advantage rule that we have in the industry with a lot of advancements in technology doesn't necessarily apply here. And I think that's why generative AI uh, is, is really this new gold rush um, with every cybersecurity vendor basically latching on to possibilities. And we're seeing a lot of that um, being led, I would say, by uh, big tech organizations, too, as far as use cases that they're helping solve. But I, I frankly think the best solutions that will drive the most valuable outcomes to protect organizations are really yet to come. So, you know, one example we talk about here is given that there's a huge cybersecurity skills gap, I think we'll absolutely see solutions that are aimed at making it easier for uh, cyber analysts, security engineers to rely on generative AI to augment their ability to learn new products or even conduct tasks. And so there's like a few vendors I've spoken with individually, uh, CEOs, whose product models are basically uh, based on augmenting or replacing like lower tier SOC analysts. 
So their existing employees that they have can basically like level up and focus on uh, tasks that require more decision-making capabilities. So let me make it clear, you know, I don't think people that are aspiring to get into cybersecurity have anything to fear. I'm optimistic that it can be leveraged to kind of level up folks, level up staff, and it'll decrease the time that's required for them to learn and manage different cybersecurity tools. So a, a couple more things here. You know, as this technology matures uh, and improves, I think we'll start to see aspects of it in more and more cybersecurity products. So, you know, anticipating we'll see, uh, I, I would say in the future, maybe it's a couple of years from now, I think we'll see a little bit of a divided security community. And what I mean by that is, I believe some experts will learn to trust the decisions that are made and uh, by these sort of tools, and they'll lean heavily into the combination of uh, augmented human and machine decision making. But I also think it's possible that things could sway in an opposite direction where we trust the AI to make security decisions and it makes bad ones. And that leads to unexpected consequences, maybe things like, you know, more governance and regulations. And I think both of these futures could be possible. So to answer the second part of your question um, regarding uh, industries targeted, you know, uh, I think attackers are going to leverage generative AI against any industry in many different ways. And I don't think we need to cover all of the different ways in which attackers are going to leverage it today. You know, from improving the ability to automate and carry out attacks to creating new strains of malware, I believe the possibilities from an attacker's perspective are pretty much endless. Uh, and and it, it continues to be talked about widely in underground forums. So, you know, if I was to make some further out predictions, I think generative AI will eventually be leveraged by attackers to help increase the speed at which they can locate valuable information within an organization quickly and help improve extortion demands. That is a kind of a further out prediction that I have. And I think this will be a, overall a new category of risk that will be a constant race for defenders to keep up with. So, you know, uh, these new tools and techniques that are being developed by attackers may leverage these generative AI components. And in response to that in the industry, we're seeing big tech companies publish AI security frameworks like Google's just came out, uh, Microsoft has one as well. And I think a lot of this will help better arm defenders in this sort of new era that we're facing. Uh, but companies kind of have to proactively uh, investigate how to remain defensible from these advancements that are actually happening. So I know that was rather long-winded, but I wanted to share a lot of uh, insight there. Oh, come on, you long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think, I think uh, you know, it, especially in regards to the first part of your answer, I think it's, uh, it's always interesting to look at technology like this that's very early on. And to Angon's point earlier, you know, we're kind of in the, we're in the thick of this, of this massive change and, you know, the risk, like you said, Tyler, the risk of something potentially going wrong is it is very real. But that's sort of the, you know, it's almost a risk. It's it's almost an inevitability when you're trying to figure out how to leverage new technology like this. Yep. Um, and and you know, same with what you said before, Tyler. It's not a reason for anyone to be worried, you know, it's not a thing to worry about, but um, it's just sort of like you gotta get over that that those first few humps and figure out not just how to use the technology itself, but do we need any sort of regulation around it? Do we need, you know, is there something that we need to do to sort of keep it in the bounds of making sure that we're still delivering, you know, the delivering security in whatever form it may be to people in the right way. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's all just, whenever you have something new like this, being, being early into, into market with it, it's always a little risky, but sort of a, sort of the pioneering step that you need. Um, and, you know, so so in that context, uh, Tyler, I'll go back to you for this. Uh, okay. yep. You know, it's it's obviously, especially in security, definitively saying yes or no to something is always a little risky. Um, but another part of these kind of conversations that we're seeing is people saying, well, should we just, you know, should companies just ban it? Is it safe? Are there, you know, big one that I've heard is, are there data privacy concerns? Um, you know, if you're asking, you know, chat GPT, for example, if you're asking it certain things about how you should maybe strategize something within your organization, and you mistakenly mentioned some, you know, some project names, or, you know, yep. some information that you don't really realize is actually proprietary, but you do, what's sort of, the, you know, what's sort of the, the risk, the concern with with all of that? 
Yeah, so I think there's been a lot of interesting information that's been published so far. Uh, one of the things that we've seen recently was the results of a recent Salesforce survey um, where they've said 71% of 500 senior IT leaders um, are concluding that generative AI is likely to introduce new security risks to data. We've seen some other examples where uh, Samsung has reportedly issued a memo prohibiting the use of generative AI uh, systems like ChatGPT to prevent the upload of sensitive company data to external servers. And then we've seen other examples where uh, countries like Italy uh, has a privacy guarantor that's banning ChatGPT and it's an immediate effect as it as it really further investigates data privacy sort of procedures. So uh, more broadly speaking, I would say we're seeing companies pretty well divided right now on how they're responding to generative AI and whether or not the employees at each organization there uh, can use it uh, or tools like ChatGPT. I think the four categories that we're seeing, like four major categories are companies that are outright banning their use, companies that are allowing the use, but only to uh, only via like uh, security approved sanctioned generative AI tools and sites. The third category is like companies that allow full use, but can ensure that sensitive data cannot be passed into those chatbots. And this, this actually relies on having really good data definitions, um, making sure that the organization actually is classifying data that is sensitive correctly. That's a huge uh, piece of that. And then the last category is companies that are allowing just everyone to freely access the site. And I, I think we're seeing a lot of, uh, you, you mentioned something earlier about um, this, this new era that we're pioneering in. Um, I'm seeing a lot more uh, of this leaning towards the, the all or nothing, like let's ban it outright or let's allow everything. Um, and, and less actually focus on the governance and privacy aspects, which is concerning. So, you know, I believe that there are definitely data privacy concerns if you freely use any of the services that are available out there. And, it, and that generally speaking, wide use of these services opens up a new avenue of insider risk that C CISOs have to consider. So there are some configuration uh, data control settings with popular ones like ChatGPT to allow you to turn off the ability for these systems to save or use that chat information to, to improve or train their models. But like, how do you control that universally across all of these tools, right? And so uh, I don't think these settings can be really well controlled universally yet, or are guaranteed to even exist across all of those. So, you know, you gotta be educated enough to like understand the terms and conditions in order to realize what might be shared. And with the new sites that are popping up every day, I think most people need to consider that whatever you enter into one of these sites, you should treat it as if the information is basically now in the public domain. So this is where the problem ends up existing because organizations may not be able to rely on its employees to discern, you know, what information is actually sensitive or not. And this is where you need a combination of probably technology controls and education and user training uh, to really address these sort of risks holistically. Yeah, that's all incredibly well said. And, and I think one of the places, and I think especially to highlight something in there, just treating all that information, you know, like it's available in the public domain, it's just take that, take that approach. And that's really just, you know, if, if you even have a question about whether it's okay, it's probably it's probably not okay um, right. to to put something like that out there. Um, and so one of the places that uh, I think people, for all the conversation we're having about people debating this, I think the one place where people agree that generative AI could have real immediate effectiveness and impact for threat actors is with phishing, right? And and phishing is typically a lower cost, you know, lower. Um, you know, it, 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 you have to be a, a super highly skilled actor to execute a phishing campaign. You can even go on, you know, on the dark web and buy a full kit for 250 bucks or even less. And and yep. there you go. You can fish people on all sorts of platforms, both for personal and, and, and enterprise uh, credentials. Um, but really in, in the context here, you know, I think the risk is that in the past, phishing campaigns, you could usually spot them with uh, risks or with uh, giveaways like, uh, you know, poor grammar, spelling mistakes, uh, things like that. So obviously generative AI, hey, write me a message. Um, you know, you kind of, sometimes you have to work your way around it, but basically write me a message pretending to be the CEO of this company and telling people that I need, you know, I need them to give me their, their login or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and 
you know, could even go so far as say, hey, tell me more about this company so that when I reach out to their employees on LinkedIn pretending to be a recruiter, uh, you know, and, and trying to get them to, to download a, a malicious file, you know, as a job, fake job description, something yeah. like that. There's so many ways it can go. But again, it just it makes things more convincing and, and reduces the number of potential mistakes on the attacker's part, which could obviously increase their their effectiveness. So um, obviously, this is all kind of basically what I'm talking about social engineering. So what's what's your take on on all this? Not yeah. honestly, both of you, uh, I think, probably have have thoughts on this from different perspectives. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll, I'll start off. Um, you already mentioned like the changes in in uh, improvements in grammar, for example. But I think even beyond that, um, we're going to see threat actors that are able to leverage new languages that they haven't mastered previously um, to help uh, write more convincing uh, messages that target you know organizations who whom is a primary language that they don't. Uh, natively speak. Um, so I think that's one big thing there to take that a step further. Uh, we have a we have a stat here from Gartner where, uh, you know, by 2025, the consumerization of AI enabled fraud will fundamentally change the enterprise attack surface, driving more outsourcing of enterprise trust and focus on security education awareness. Again, like, security education awareness is so important here. But um, it, it, it will be it will be paired in the market with security tools and products that do things like um, being able to detect within messages uh, that an AI wrote this particular message and maybe even do things like block it or right. So um, I think we will absolutely see a combination of uh, security awareness, education and training combined with security tools uh, to to thwart these sort of uh, improved social engineering attacks. But I think uh, it has huge implications for not just uh, minimizing or eliminating grammar, grammar mistakes. Um, I also think it has the ability to help improve personalization of the messages um, and, and then minimize things like uh, language problems for phishing campaigns, right? So uh, what was interesting that I found recently was, you know, uh, the company Abnormal Security recently sort of detailed that threat actors are beginning to harness the power of generative AI to produce more, you know, more f uh, phishing and business email compromise attacks. So now we're seeing it out there, right? Uh, and, and I would like to caution and say, like, phishing is a... Uh, is definitely an initial access vector that is primarily used. Um, but, but things like uh, direct, you know, services that can be directly exploited, um, those are still more prevalent, more seen. Phishing is absolutely on the increase. Think of it as a way in which attackers are going to be able to more quickly create convincing messages that have minimal errors, that may even undertake the, the context of previous messages that that user wrote or talked about publicly or even spoke within YouTube videos, as an example. I think all of that could be leveraged for future future sort of phishing attacks. But I think we're just now starting to see this evidence come out. Uh, you know, Ab Abnormal released this article I mentioned the other day. Do I anticipate this to be in every attacker's arsenal uh, as it relates to improving phishing attacks? No, but I do anticipate attackers to sort of leverage everything at their disposal in the future, just like they do today, to increase their chances of making phishing attempts seem more convincing. You know, I predict that we will see technology solutions aimed at detecting the use, as I mentioned, um, and, and even uh, maybe even detecting like uh, voice phishing messages that are generated by AI uh, and, and being able to block those in the future. So uh, those are some of the things that I think about. Uh, we're just finding a lot. We're just finding evidence now of threat actors that are leveraging it. I would say. Angan, yeah. what else do you have to add? Yeah. To add further, I think uh, you know attackers have more access to sophisticated tools, and thanks to Gen AI systems, and they can do phishing attack with less effort nowadays. And to safeguard our end users, we need sophisticated tools also. To prevent them uh, doing the phishing attack. So Lookout is building um, phishing and content production capability with state-of-the-art AI and ML tools. And we're continuously doing research on how we can protect our end users and customers. And it's a really important area to you know investigate and take further, I would say. Um, you know, just to wrap wrap that piece up there. Um, 
the ability to thwart uh, these types of attacks that are going to be increasing within the industry and be leveraged more, um, it, it's absolutely imperative that you know we stay on top of innovating in this sort of space and and taking this technology further to protect organizations from various industries because every industry could potentially be uh, a target as we see with any other attack that occurs today yeah you're both you're both spot on there um and and guys we're coming up on time here um so we're going to kind of wrap things up but yep. i think the one thing i want to kind of leave folks with is that you know with with gen ai gen ai ooh, still getting used to saying it um you know likely being this this strong contributing factor to more sophisticated and 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 more convincing like you guys mentioned uh phishing scams of, of all types and this is across you know all platforms it's not just email it's you know we see it in our, in our world we see it in all sorts of basically any app with a messaging functionality um could be kind of a channel uh, or conduit for for a phishing attack and and especially thinking about social engineering in the context of you know social media platforms or something like a linkedin or you know telegram whatsapp whatever it is um, there are all sorts of ways for for it to happen um but you know so it's it really is important to understand how all of that is is trending and, and how it's affecting enterprise security and and if you do want to learn more about that uh we do have our global state of mobile phishing report um we put this out just a couple months ago um, I believe it is linked in this post. Um, if not, it's on the, the Lookout website. Um, you can download it there. Uh, but for now, it's it's time to sign off. So guys, thank you both so much for joining me today. And thank you for everybody uh, who stopped by on LinkedIn Live. And we'll see you next time on our next episode of Talk Data to Me. Have a good one. Thanks for having us. Bye.